Good morning. At this time, will sergeants please start their recordings? PC recording good. Thank you. Call recording rolling. Thank you and good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Public Safety. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, Chair Adams. We are ready to begin. Good morning. I'm Council Member Adrian Adams of the 28th District in Queens, and I am the chair of the committee. Uh, I'd like to let you all know that I am wearing denim today in recognition of uh, sexual standing in solidarity with the Women's Caucus of the New York City Council in that recognition. I'd also like to express my condolences to the members of the NYPD and the family members of Officer Anastasio Sakos, who lost his life very tragically this week. Our condolences and our prayers go with you all. So on to the hearing. I know that a lot of you tuning in for this hearing are anxious to get to the heavy questions that we've been reckoning with for some time now about what role the police should play in our society, what kinds of force they should be able to use in what situations, and how much we should be spending on our police department. These are very important questions. And uh, at our budget hearing in May, I'm sure those issues will, will be at the forefront of our discussion. Today, however, we choose to examine an issue that may appear narrower, but in a lot of ways is representative of some of the problems that those larger questions address. The collateral consequences of getting caught up in the criminal justice system, or to be more precise, the unnecessary, excessive, and regressive punishments that come with simply being accused. Often these consequences do nothing more than exacerbate the circumstances that led the person to the point of arrest. That is, of course, assuming the person actually did something wrong, which is often not the case when we're just talking about an arrest. Today's topic is about what happened in connection with an arrest. And I want to make sure right up front that nobody is saying that officers are doing anything other than what they're told to do. This is not an issue of accountability for individual officers but it is a policy issue. More specifically, it's about why we have a policy that presumes that lawfully owned property, not guns, not drugs, but things we all carry, like cell phones or cash or prescription medication, even when the overwhelming majority of these items have nothing at all to do with a criminal case. Under the rules of the city of New York, if an officer designates a cell phone as arrest evidence, the individual who was arrested has to jump through a number of bureaucratic hurdles that can take weeks to resolve, all while the person is unable to contact loved ones, attend school virtually, participate in online programming, communicate with employers, meet with therapists, all the necessities of life. What's more, they're unable to access all of the things stored in their phones that we now all rely on having at our fingertips. This problem is particularly pressing for our young people during COVID, when much of their education and almost all of their daily life is dependent on their ability to log into websites from their phones. So why is it set up this way? Why does the NYPD voucher and keep phones as a matter of course? Why isn't the burden on the prosecutor to affirm that there is a clear connection with a criminal case before the property can be withheld by the police? Our tendency toward take first and figure out if we need it later is simply unjust, and it has caused many other problems in the past. Stop and frisk was a presumption that evidence of crime might be in people's pockets. Bail reform efforts targeted the presumption that you need to lock people up first and ask about where that's necessary later. If DAs really think that crucial evidence is on someone's phone, they can get a search warrant and search the phone. But more often than not, they don't. And instead, 
unnecessary lifeline is taken away for people who haven't been arrested, which let's be clear, is still typically poor of poor people of color. So maybe it's time to reevaluate how we do this. I'm sure there are cases where a phone is relevant evidence or where a district attorney might want to get a search warrant to search personal property. And there should certainly be a process for that. But given the constitutional issues here, it's time to make keeping people's property, especially cell phones, and especially cell phones that belong to juveniles, the exception rather than the norm. I'm interested in hearing what the NYPD suggests we can do about this. And I'm interested in learning more from defenders and advocates about the issues they're seeing under the current system. We're also hearing today, Introduction 2108, sponsored by Council Member Cabrera. The bill would increase the minimum fine for damaging a house of worship from $500 to $1,000. Hate has no place here in New York City. And this straightforward bill one who would target any of our religious communities. I would now like to mention that we have been joined today by my colleagues, council members, uh, Riley, Cabrera, and Holden. And we will join us shortly. At this time, I would like to, uh, we also have been joined by council members Rosenthal, Menchaca, Brannon, and Miller. And at this time, I would like to invite my colleague, council member Rafael Cabrera to give his remarks. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Madam Chair, really appreciate the opportunity uh, to have a moment to discuss um, intro 2008. As it was stated, it would increase the penalties from $500 to $1,000 for anyone who willfully, let me say that again, who willfully defaces and damages any houses of worship. Lately, we have witnessed a spike of crimes of hate targeting religious institutions of all faith. As a pastor myself, I have seen my own church uh, target and deface after, let me be clear, after I introduced this bill back in uh, October. I have spoken with imams, rabbis, pastors who have suffered the same fate. Last weekend, we all witnessed the awful attacks of synagogues in Riverdale, right here in the Bronx. Uh, these uh, incidents are mounted to damages in the thousands, but even more than that, it's the aura of intimidation. Testimony has been provided today by the Archdiocese of New York and the Archdiocese of Brooklyn that have registered over 42 attacks on Catholic churches since, in New York City since 2015. Uh, it, once again, resulting in thousands of dollars worth of damages. And mobs uh, have, have not been excluded uh, from acts of defacing or acts of hate. Matter of fact, I was just visiting two weeks ago a mosque, and the imam was telling me how he was, uh, his mosque was attacked not once, but twice uh, within a month. And some of these are not even reported. Uh, this is where we pray. This is where we seek peace. We come to these houses of worship with our families and friends, and we must protect them. Intro 21 to 8 is a, is a great beginning. Stand with me in the thousands of clergy leaders and parishioners. Let's send them a message that when you attack or deface one, you're attacking and defacing others. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to share, and thank you for your support. Thank you so much, Council Member Cabrera. I will now turn it over to our moderator, Committee Council Daniel Addis, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair. I'm Daniel Addis, Council to the Committee on Public Safety of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be muted until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. If council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function. I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer questions. 
All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov if you have not already done so. Members of the public may also submit written testimony. The deadline for written testimony is 72 hours after the hearing. The first panel will include members of the New York City Police Department. The second panel will include a representative of the Queens District Attorney's Office, and we will then hear, members, uh, hear from members of the public. To the first panel, before I call on you to testify, I will administer the oath. I will read the oath and call on each of you to affirm. Please raise your right hands. Do you swear to tell the truth? Uh, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? Uh, Assistant Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters, Oleg Chernovsky. I do. Managing Attorney of the Legislative Affairs Unit, Michael Clark. I do. Captain Zahid Williams, Information Technology Bureau. I do. Thank you all. And I believe, Deputy Commissioner, you'll be reading the testimony. Is that right? Yes. You may begin. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Chair, for your kind words and um, uh, about Officer Sakos. And we ask that you keep him and his family in your hearts and prayers. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Adams, a member of the Council. I'm Oleg Chernovsky, the Assistant Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters. I'm joined today by Michael Clark, the Managing Attorney of the NYPD's Legislative Affairs Unit, and Captain Zahid Williams from the NYPD's Information Technology Bureau. On behalf of Police Commissioner Dermot Shea, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to discuss seize the seizure of property by the NYPD. The NYPD is committed to ensuring that property that is taken into our custody is properly safeguarded and returned to its owner. We take our responsibility to accept, catalog, safeguard, store, produce for court, and return property to its legal owner seriously. At the time of arrest, officers, officers may classify property taken into custody in a variety of ways, including the vouchering for safekeeping as found property, as a decedent's property, as arrest evidence, as peddler property, or as investigatory evidence. The decision on how to classify property is unique to the facts and circumstances of each individual case. While the department's mission is to safeguard an arrestee's or decedent's personal belongings only to return those items once the owner comes to claim them, we have an even greater responsibility to act as custodian and maintain chain of custody of property that is arrest and investigatory evidence. Failure to maintain proper control of these latter categories of seized property may very well result in unsuccessful prosecutions for serious crimes, such as gun crimes, sex crimes, murders, robberies, and burglaries. Fundamental to our precision policing model is the focus on those who commit the most serious crimes in order to build the best possible criminal case, and the data bears this out. The department is only interested in retaining custody of property that can help prosecutors in their to help prosecutors in these serious crimes and does not seek to hold people's property unnecessarily. The NYPD is not interested in retaining a phone for arrest evidence that has no evidentiary value and the department aims to limit such seizures to the most serious cases. There are times that property recovered from an individual is necessary for prosecuting the crime for which a person was arrested. It is essential that we make sure we build a strong, as strong a case as possible to support the prosecution of serious cases by the district attorney's offices. Cell phones in particular have become an integral tool in building these criminal cases. These devices contain significant amounts of uh, information that can help prosecutors prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. See, seizing these devices allows officers to ensure that data contained on the phone is neither lost nor erased without the assistant district attorney being able to determine whether and to what extent valuable evidence can be utilized. It is important to note that the police department cannot simply search a phone because it has been vouchered. An investigator may look at the exterior of a phone, but officers do not have the legal right to access the contents of the phone without a probable cause warrant signed by a judge or consent of the owner of the property. It would be improper to access it otherwise, and any evidence would be suppressed by a judge. In 2020, the NYPD vouchered roughly 55,000 cell phones. 
Of those, the NYPD vouchered phones as arrest evidence or investigatory evidence approximately 28% of the time, or 15,462 phones. 35,436 phones were vouchered for safekeeping, and roughly 3,661 were vouchered as either found property or decedent's property. In 2020, the NYPD made 140,408 arrests, meaning that the department was vouchering cell phones as arrest evidence and investigatory evidence in just 11% of its cases. Of the 15,462 cell phones vouchered as arrest and investigatory evidence, 3,666 were for possession of a dangerous weapon, i.e. guns. 1,153 were for robbery. 556 were for murder or man manslaughter. 550 were for burglary. 547 were for grand larceny. 500 and 503 were for felony assault. 329 were for sex crimes. And 164 were for grand larceny of a motor vehicle. Of the roughly 55,000 cell phones that were vouchered by the NYPD, 2013 involved individuals uh, under the age of 18. A little more than half or 1,068 were vouchered as arrest or investigatory evidence. The 1,068 phones were vouchered from 731 unique individuals, meaning that in some cases, more than one phone was seized from a particular person. Of the 1,068 cell phones that were vouchered as arrest or investigatory evidence from juveniles, over 90% were arrest, were evidence in serious felony cases. This includes 327 devices vouchered for possession of uh, dangerous weapons, 227 in connection with robberies, 85 in connection with grand larcenies, 75 uh, in connection with murder or manslaughter, 56 in connection with burglaries, 49 in connection with grand larcenies, uh, grand larceny of a motor vehicle, and 47 for felony assault, and 11 for sex crimes. When property is vouchered for safekeeping, an individual merely needs to identification and the voucher uh, to retrieve the property. When the property has been vouchered as arrest evidence, the individual will need to produce a release from the district attorney's office in order to obtain the property. The DA's office will release evidence at the conclusion of a case or where an ADA determines that the evidence is not necessary for a trial. Likewise, property seized for investigation will be returned with a release from the investigator unless an arrest is made and the property is recategorized as arrest evidence. In such cases, the evidence release policy is adhered to. The NYPD seeks to make retrieval of an individual's property as easy as, and seamless as possible. Instructions to, receive proper, to retrieve property are included in English and Spanish with every voucher. Additionally, instructions can be found on the NYPD's website and can be translated into more than 100 languages. Moreover, Individuals can call 311 to find out the procedure for retrieving their property. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Before we get into the arrest letter that I sent along with council members Gibson and Levin requesting uh, clear data uh, about uh, property seizure uh, and arrests involving young people. When am I going to get a response to that letter? We're still working on it. Some of the data is uh, difficult, if not impossible for us to get at this moment. Um, so we're trying to get as much data as we can um, to respond to the letter. Um, at this moment, we're still working on it. Some of it we may not be able to get um, but we're hoping to have a response uh, short, as soon as we can. Does that mean over the next month, over the next two months, over the next 30 days, 60 days? No, we'll be, we'll try to the extent we can, whatever data we can pull in connection with the letter, uh, can, uh, Chair, we're going to get to you within days. Okay. Okay. 
So uh, there's some data on your website that I believe is supposed to reflect property seized in the year of the report. But for example, the 2020 report says that some of the property was retained for two or three years, which clearly is not possible. So can you explain how that report works? Is it reporting the property that was returned in 2020? Yeah, so I think I think you're talking about Appendix D in the public report. Um, my understanding is we're we're reporting on the property that was returned in 2020. How long that property was kept? So right, so in 2020 there could be no property; it was kept for two or longer than two, longer than a year. Um, but it's property probably that was seized in 2018, 2019 that was returned in 2020. Okay. How much money did the NYPD retain in 2020 because individuals didn't claim it? Uh, Council member, while Mike is getting the numbers that you're asking for, uh, I think it's important to talk about the process of uh, one seizing property, for example, for safekeeping, which is going to be most of the, the dollar amount that you're talking about and the process for getting it back. So, for example, if we seize property that has no evidentiary value and we're seizing it for safekeeping, let's assume an individual was arrested and they had a sum of money in their pocket, they had a pair of keys in their pocket, a cell phone in their pocket, and none of these items have evidentiary value, we're holding on to these items for that individual. So when that individual gets released, all they need to do is come to the precinct or the uh, property clerk facility and get the property back. To the extent that an individual, and this is property vouchered as safekeeping, to the extent the individual doesn't come forward and doesn't retrieve the property, that property effectively stays on the books or stays on the shelf. Ultimately, over time, the property becomes city property. None of these items, whether we, uh, whether the city takes possession of the property and it's auctioned off or in the form of money, that over a certain amount of time, it just becomes city property pursuant to law. None of that property goes to the NYPD. It goes to the city's general fund. With that said, uh, we make every effort to return that money. So even if the individual, it's a lot easier when it comes to money, because it's not like you're auctioning off money like a piece of property. So if an individual comes even beyond the dates that are prescribed in law to retrieve their property, we make every effort to connect that individual with the money that was seized and return it to them. And then the overall amount of currency that uh, was that was retained because uh, no person retrieved it was about six, a little under six million dollars between the five between the five boroughs. And again, that's not property that was seized in 2020. It could have been property seized over many years before that it's just it was converted in 2020 because nobody came to retrieve it but that's not to say if somebody comes forward at a later date we're not going to make every effort to connect them with that money so that, so that's still a problem we're, ta we're talking about somewhere around six million dollars uh, or so that that's retained um taken mostly from poor black and brown new yorkers because they don't know how to get their stuff back so that's a problem. Um, the report also shows that most evidence that's returned to people is returned within six months. But when you're talking about cell phones, cash, medication, there's a huge difference between a couple of days versus six months. So do you have any more specific data um, within that six month period about how long it takes for people to get their stuff back when they ask for it? We're just trying to get to, trying to understand the system. Sure. So, I mean, I think the, the best way to describe it is, you know, let's take a look at the process, right? From the moment the property is vouchered until uh, let's hope that it's retrieved by the individual it's vouchered from. So if we're vouchering property, and again, depending on the category it's vouchered in would probably, you know, dictate the length of time that it sees. But let's use the simplest one, which is uh, safekeeping. If we seize your property as safekeeping, generally that happens when we arrest an individual. That person, the moment they're released, can come right to the precinct and retrieve that property. 
If their identification is vouchered in the voucher, we will look into the voucher to identify them because what they need to retrieve the property is identification and a voucher number, right? So we'll be able, so in the case where your ID is actually vouchered and it's in the voucher, we'd be able to look at the voucher, at the property, the property bag, and see if that's you, we'd be able to identify you and return it to you. Um, you can come there within 24 hours and get it. I mean, it's really up to the individual to show up and get it. Now, every precinct has a property room uh, the property room, as you could imagine, is not a very large room. So after a certain amount of days, um, it's uh, the property is moved to the property clerk division, to effectively the warehouse. So if you don't retrieve your property in that time limit, and it fluctuates, if it's a much busier command that needs the space, uh, they'll probably push the property out to the property room, let's say, uh, after about a week and the slower commands that aren't in dire need of the space, maybe the property will be in that command's property room a little longer. At the end of the day, through our, our PET system, which tracks the property, we're able to know where that property is at any given moment. So as long as you come and retrieve it, you we can tell you exactly where to go to get your property. And depending on how it's vouchered, so the, again, the easiest one is safekeeping, you can come within hours and retrieve it. As soon, once you're arraigned and you're let go, you can come and get that property. If the property is vouchered as evidence or investigation, again, that's a much smaller subset of the total universe of, of property that's vouchered. Well, there's a process for that because if, if that piece of evidence is, if that item is needed as evidence in the case, then you know we can't release it. We would be breaking chain of custody. We would effectively be contaminating evidence and undermining the prosecution of the case. So when you're talking about arrest evidence, the process there is that once we voucher it and catalog it as arrest evidence, the individual, the instructions that individual is given with their voucher is that you can get a district attorney's release. So one, they're given the voucher as notice that your property was seized and it's marked as arrest evidence. Two, they're given instructions on how to get arrest evidence back uh, if they want to reclaim it. One of the instructions is you have to get a district attorney's release. So if the district attorney determines that the property has no investigatory value, and that was part of your opening statement to get the DAs more involved in the process, well, they are. So once we voucher the property and the DA can, makes a determination they don't need it as evidence, or they could take a photograph and release it, or it just has no evidentiary value, they'd issue a district attorney's release, and we would release that property the same as we would release safekeeping. So as quickly as that takes, we would release it. For things that are vouchered as investigatory, uh, similar process, right? The investigator investigates. Generally, investigatory evidence could be seized uh, if we're executing a search warrant, but no arrest is made. Uh, any property that we seize, it's not arrest evidence because there was no arrest made, but it can become arrest evidence once arrests, once an arrest is made and the DA could then release it with the district attorney's release as arrest evidence. So that's the process. So, so you, you're referencing the, the DA. Now, the Queens DA's office has said that they grant the to release arrest evidence in 93% of cases. So we're really overshooting the mark here, in my opinion, considering that 40% of cell phones never go back to the owner. Shouldn't you be narrowing the criteria for what constitutes, constitutes arrest evidence to cases where the cell phone um, is obviously part of the case? Well, I mean, look, like anything, we can always look at what our procedures are. But if you take a look at just the raw numbers, I mean, if we're taking a look at um, the overall number of arrests, there were 140,000 arrests last year, and the cell phones seized for arrest evidence or investigation numbered 15,000 right? So they're not being seized wholesale in connection with every arrest made and vouchered as arrest evidence. But then when you take a look at the categories where, you know, the most common categories where um, cell phones are seized, and I'm going to look at the all ages, not focusing on juveniles. Um, 
you're looking at uh, 23% or almost 24% are for dangerous weapons such as guns. 17% um, when you're talking about all ages are for dangerous drugs like heroin, fentanyl, or, or uh, crack cocaine. 7.5% are for robberies, 36 are for murder. Uh, burglary are 3.6%, grand larceny are 3.5%. And also keep in mind that the fact that we're seizing a phone for arrest evidence, that could be a recovered stolen phone. So it's not necessarily that it's your phone that's being, maybe you were arrested and the phone was seized, but that phone may have been the phone of the victim that was robbed. That's vouchered under your name and then again, that would go through the DA's office and they would issue the release to the victim, but that is evidence in that case. So then there's that category. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, it is used judiciously. Can we look at the process more? Of course, we always do, um, but it is it is a subset. I mean, it's 11% of the cases uh, are, the, it's 11% of the cases and mind you, I think over 90% of all the cell phones we seize are for serious felonies. So it's not really, it's not low level crimes that we're seizing these and marking them for evidence. So, uh, so a couple of, couple more things and I'm gonna let my uh, colleagues get in here. The, 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 you, there are several different terms that we're speaking about today. You're speaking about arrest evidence um, and there's also investigative evidence also, um, but we couldn't find any legal authority or definition for what constitutes investigative evidence. So can you give us a, des a definition of what investigative evidence is? Sure, it's uh, evidence that we would seize. I mean, it's a, va it's a category in the voucher. So for example, if a judge issues the department a uh, probable cause warrant to do a search warrant at a location, and from that location, we'll recover, let's say, some guns, some drugs, some cash, some scales, and a few cell phones, right? All of, but no arrest is made at that location, right? Because nobody was home when we executed it. That all of that property, from guns down to cash and cell phones, would be vouchered as investigatory evidence. Now, that property would ultimately be converted to arrest evidence once an arrest is made, but you can't call it arrest evidence if no arrest was made at that moment. It's called investigatory evidence. So what's my legal recourse? If you arrest me and take my cell phone, what's, what's my legal recourse? If you deem something of mine as investi an investigative evidence? So if I'm, if I'm arrest, you're, I just want to be clear on, on your question. If, I'm arresting you, then I'm not vouchering as, a, as an investigation. I'm vouchering it as arrest evidence. If there's no arrest, and let's say in the warrant scenario, that's going to be investigatory. When you have an investigatory, uh, when property is vouchered as investigatory, the, the method to get it back would be to get the investigator to issue a release, which is really effectively the same as a district attorney's release for arrest evidence, but it would be the investigator's release, basically saying that property is no longer necessary in the investigation. If an arrest is made before that investigatory evidence is released, it gets recategorized as arrest evidence and follows that path. All right, so, so let, let's, let's turn it uh, uh, around a little bit and take a look at internal oversight, right? Um, when an officer takes property from someone who's arrested, are there any internal oversight mechanisms to ensure that everything is above board? And we've had complaints that folks that are arrested never see their property. We've had complaints that folks that are arrested, all of a sudden their, their property mysteriously uh, 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 goes away, is taken away, disappears at the hands of the arresting officer. What, are, what is your internal oversight to handle situations like that? And what is the legal recourse to someone who has been arrested who, whose property just mysteriously vanishes? Sure. So, I mean, the layers of recourse, I, I mean, I and I know I, I'm going to miss the layers of uh, a few of them, but 
there are just so many. There's from the supervisor, let's start off at the point of vouchering, it gets vouchered at a precinct. There are supervisors, whether it be a sergeant, lieutenant, all the way up to the precinct CO that has the oversight of property and the vouchering process right there at command. When the property gets transferred, there's uh, oversight mechanisms of property in the uh, property division. Um, there's Internal Affairs Bureau that does effectively audits um, and, and checks to see if uh, they actually will put somebody, we have these mechanisms where internal affairs will put an internal affairs undercover to be, to, to test the system, to be arrested and to have their property seized to see if it gets vouchered properly, right? So it's, you know, they stage an arrest and do integrity tests of police officers. And that's, that's yet another process. Um, and I'm sure I'm missing... A lot of these, we have our uh, data integrity unit. We have, um, uh, what's the unit? I'm quality, forgetting the quality assurance, quality, assurance quality assurance division, which is a whole division that's set up to monitor, among other things, the vouchering of property. But in terms of recourse, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, somebody clearly has a civil right of action if they're claiming that uh, the department took their property and they never got it back, or that property was damaged while the department was the custodian of that property, they have civil recourse. Uh, okay, I think we're gonna deal with that um, probably at another time, because I think there are several layers of this onion to be peeled back um, regarding this particular issue. Um, I'd like to know um, or specifically what the mechanisms are specifically. The cash goes where it's supposed to go and not where it's supposed to go you know, what happens, um, what are the internal checks and balances that you have in place to make sure that officers aren't abusing their authority when it comes to personal property and other things of value they might recover in a search. Um, I'd like to hear very, very specifically um, what the NYPD does about that. Um, so um, I, I think we'll, we'll deal with that um, more specifically at a later time, but I do want to get that out there as well. Um, I'd like to also... Uh, acknowledge uh, that we've been joined by council members Rod Rodriguez, Powers, and Gibson. Council, uh, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Oleg. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I just ask any council members to who wish to ask questions to use the Zoom raise hand function. We'll give everybody a minute. Um, Do we have any council members who would like to ask questions? Uh, looks like council member Menchaca. Thank you, chair. I am having trouble with the camera for whatever reason. So uh, I'll just hit, hit uh, the, uh, the NYPD with a question. Uh, this, is, this is a general question about, about evidence and this longer story about connecting people back to their, uh, their property uh, and and more about just the general plan for storing property in general. And if you can give us an update, Oleg, I know this is something that we have been talking about a lot because there is an evidence storage place in Red Hook uh, with a, uh, essentially with a, a cliff on timing. Can you give us a quick update on, on, on just like the overall evidence uh, plan in the city of New York and storage, et cetera. This could be an interesting component to this longer question about how long you take evidence and, and how quickly you wanna get it back out so you don't have to store it somewhere in the city. Sure, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'll have to do a little digging on the status of Red Hook. I know we had worked on it over a year ago, pre-pandemic, so I'll get status there. But I, I mean, I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you that the, overall larger picture of storing of property has taken a massive setback uh, because the we we there was a plan uh, and was funded to have a uh, one one facility rather than have these number of facilities around the city that was going to be used to store it was going to be the single uh, property storage facility for the department 
uh, but that was that that facility was defunded in the last budget. So, um, and we'd also had a problem with the ULIP. The, the landlord hadn't wa didn't want to wait as long as it took to get through the process. Um, so we lost it. So we are still working on that. I, I know on the Red Hook facility, we have maybe eight years left on uh, the approved lease, maybe seven. I don't remember the exact exact time we we extended it. Um, so that that is part of the discussion is trying to modernize all our property property storage and tracking systems to get into a new era where it's some of the stuff will be a lot easier for us to report out and 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 store. Um, but I, like like always said, we have to on, on the specific project we we'll have to go back and find out a little bit more uh, where we stand. Okay. Yeah. Well, and it's really not just the bread hook, but I think this larger question about about storage and the ever growing concern that you all have in where to store things and and with this community pressure i think uh the chair is onto something in terms of how we just get people back their stuff as soon as possible so that it's not this is it's like a logistics issue uh separate and apart from the social justice issue and getting black and brown people their their property uh Let's get it back to them. And this could be a nice little pressure point that can inform this bigger discussion. So uh, I'll follow up with you on, on all the rest of that stuff. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, we'll have no opposition from us. I mean, we look, it takes resources for us to store property that certainly that we're capable of giving back. I mean, we're not talking about the smaller universe of arrest evidence or investigate uh, investigatory evidence that has uh, a value in the criminal prosecution. But even that, once the DA releases it, the turnaround time of individuals actually picking up arrest evidence is, you know, it, it's folks are running back and retrieving their property within hours, even though they're they're able to do that. So, I, I mean, we, we don't have a vested interest in holding on to property for protracted amount of times. We would like to relinquish it as soon as possible. In fact, our property clerk tells me that every day they want to get it out as soon as possible. Okay, well, I, Chair, um, I'd like to work with you on this. Uh, as someone who holds a property um, evidence location uh, in the district. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Menchaca, and uh, we will definitely get together on that. Uh, I don't think there are any other questions for my colleagues, so I'll just wrap up with this. You know, to me, the system, it, uh, I mean, it, it's been explained by you all um, pretty easily, but to me, it's, it's very problematic. Um, we've got an issue with checks and balances. Um, we've got issues when, you know, folks go to pick up their proper property. What happens if the property clerk says no? Um, they have to get permission from the DA. So, you know, why do we have to have a system where tens of thousands of people year uh, realistically have to jump through a lot of uh, bureaucratic hoops and hurt the property I mean I'm so I'm sorry council member you, you you broke up a little bit but I think I got the gist of your question about individuals having to jump through hoops to get to get property am I about right yes you are yeah. So uh, again, as I as I said, I think the quote unquote controversial part of this conversation, I don't think it's the safekeeping evidence, which is by far the vast majority of the property uh, that we seize. It gets categorized as safekeeping. Um, folks can get that back literally within hours of its seizure. Uh, and again, all they need is an ID and the voucher number. And we'll facilitate that to the extent the IDs, you know, been vouchered. We'll look at the voucher to see if if the ID is there and connect the individual. I mean, we have, I mean, we offer different points where the process of retrieving that evidence is explained, whether it's on the voucher that's given to the individual, whether it's on through 311. Um, you know, it's in different languages to make it easier. It's on our website. Uh, we're, we're doing our best to want to explain it to and to connect 
individuals with their property to the extent that we can. Um, again, when it comes to arrest evidence and investigatory evidence, really, it comes down to chain of custody. I mean, and we cannot relinquish evidence. I mean, I don't think anybody at this hearing is in favor in any way of undermining or compromising a prosecution for a serious offense. And mind you, over 90% of the cell phones, if we're focusing on cell phones, over 90% of the cell phones we seize and mark as arrest evidence or investigation are for serious felonies. You know, uh, whether it be homicide or guns or robberies or burglaries, the, these are major, major crimes that it's in all of our collective best interest to have as strong of a prosecution as possible, not to have any evidence escape or get contaminated. But we have, again, there is a process in place. One, the individual is made aware of what they need to do to get it back. Their attorney is given an inventory list of the property that was seized from their client. So not only is the client, the defendant, given a voucher that has this explanation, but the defense lawyer is given as part of the discovery process a list of property that was seized or vouchered from their client. And as they're in contact with the prosecutor at every stage during the prosecution. So as long as the prosecutor releases it and says we don't need it as evidence, we facilitate the return of that property. We don't have a vested interest in holding on to it if it has no investigatory value. Yeah, Oleg, but you, you, you make it sound so simple, and, and I'm going to beg to differ. Um, it, it, you make it sound so very simple um, because, I mean, it, it, it doesn't seem to me that it would matter uh, whether or not the offense is serious. It's about whether um, it's relevant to the case itself. No, I mean, it, it just seems that there's a problem, and we've got to recognize how we can do this better. Um, it, it just sounds a little uh, simplistic to me, the explanation. And, um, but, but, you know, I, I, I do believe that we'll, uh, with that, um, I'm going to thank you. If I see no questions, uh, Council, no further questions. No further questions. Um, thank you to members of the NYPD. Um, Chair Adams, I'm actually going to ask if you could, we're having some issues hearing you, if you could just log off while uh, the Queen's DA is testifying and log back on just to see if that takes care of the problem. Uh, thank you to the members of the NYPD. And in just a moment, we will turn to um, Assistant District Attorney George uh, DeLuca. I'm sorry, DeLuca Ferrugia. And if you're ready, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Before, I'm, I apologize. Before we do, um, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and answer all questions to the best of your ability? I do. Thank you. Good morning. My name is ADA George DeLuca Ferrugia. I'm the Director of Extraditions, Renditions, and Property Relief Services at the Queens County District Attorney's Office. And I'm here today to present testimony on behalf of the District Attorney, Melinda Katz, who could not be here today. I'd like to thank Speaker Johnson, Chairperson Adrian Adams, and the members of the Committee on Public Safety for the opportunity to appear virtually before you to provide testimony in reference to property seizure and arrest evidence as it relates to the work of the Queens District Attorney's Office. The Queens DA's Office does not hold on to property without a specific cause or legal reason to do so in accordance with New York City rules Title 38, Section 12-34. Our office issues property releases within the guidelines set by the New York City rules and regulations, which require that the DA's office must make a decision on releasing general property within 15 days of receiving a formalized demand, consisting of both the demand form and a copy of the voucher. In cases of motor vehicles, that decision must be made within seven days. Since its founding in 2019, our Property Release Services Unit has processed over 4,700 property release requests. These requests for release are for various types of personal property, including backpacks, property found within a car, United States currency, cell phones, and motor vehicles. Upon receipt of a property release demand, one of the three decisions can be made, release, deferral or decline. 
Out of the 4,700 property release requests our office has received, a release has been issued on every demand with the exception of 342 cases where deferrals were issued. A deferral is issued in accordance with the New York City rules, which specify the basis for deferral. For non-vehicle property, we may defer its release under the following circumstances. One, if the property involves a case present, presently pending against the defendant or codependent. Two, if the case is currently pending appeal. Three, if there's a collateral attack on the property or four, if there is an ongoing investigation regarding the property. Deferrals for release of a motor vehicle can only be issued in the following circumstances. One, where photographs of the motor vehicle are needed. Two, where the appearance and or operability of the vehicle are at issue. Three, where the motor vehicle must be tested and photographed. Four, where the defendant has not yet raised a defense. And five, where the vehicle is needed to rebut a defense at trial. The Queens DA Property Release Unit notifies a claimant of the decision to defer release via email and regular mail. This notification includes the basis for the deferral and advises the claimant of the appeals process and their right to file an appeal. Of the 342 instances where property release was deferred, 64 of those involved cell phones. Since 2019, 64 appeals, and that's not a mistake, it's just a coincidence, of 64 appeals of our decision to defer releases have been filed by the claimant seeking a supervisor's review of the deferral. Of those 64 appeals of our decision to defer release, which have been filed, only four remain in deferral status. In addition, since its inception, there have been 265 separate demands for which we have declined to release property. Declines to release are often due to the fact that the property is contraband. This includes weapons, forged instruments, stolen property, or other proceeds of the crime. In addition, release may be declined if the property has been forfeited by agreement at the time of plea. In each of these instances, the claimant is mailed and emailed a letter explaining the basis for the decline. If a forfeiture agreement had been entered into, a copy of that agreement is usually sent to the claimant along with the decline letter. Oftentimes, an issue may come up during the release process where the invoice property will be categorized as investigatory. Any question regarding the classification of voucher property has to be directed to the NYPD. Our office has no control over the designation of property. When possible, we do have the assigned ADA reach out to the vouchering officer in an attempt to get them to reclassify the property. Our property releases indicate that our office no longer needs the property for trial. Once we issue that release, it is up to the NYPD to release the property. Any other holds on such property have nothing to do with our office. Once we issue a release, we have no control over what is done with the property and would direct anyone with questions to the NYPD regarding those issues. The biggest issue here is property marked for forfeiture. In those cases, we direct claimants to the NYPD Civil Enforcement Unit. Finally, throughout the pandemic, our Property Release Services Unit has continued to process every demand that has come in. Statutorily, we have 15 days on non-vehicle demands and seven days on vehicle de demands to make a determination on a release once the demand is finalized and all of the paperwork necessary to process the demand has been received. In an effort to streamline the process for those who are seeking return of the property, our office, in conjunction with the NYPD, specifically with the Queens Property Clerk's Office, has set up a system by which the releases are sent directly to the NYPD Property Clerk. Once that has happened, an email is sent to the requester advising them of the release. The District Attorney's Office does not have jurisdiction to handle any requests to release property associated with the arrest of a juvenile. Juvenile arrests are handled in family court and prosecuted by New York City Corporation Council. I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today, and I look forward to working with you and your staff on this important issue.
Thank you very, very much, Mr. DeLuca Ferrugia. Thank you. Um, I, I guess my first question of retaining, uh, of reviewing uh, retained property could be automatic. Um, right. I didn't hear your question at all, uh, Councilman Adams. I apologize. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I, I, I was asking about whether or not the process of reviewing retained property could be automatic uh, from arraignments instead of waiting for a claim in hand. Uh, Judge, uh, sorry, uh, Councilman, that's not possible because the case has to actually be assigned to an assistant who has to review the case file and make a determination as to what property is needed for uh, the purposes of um, trial and what property is not needed for purposes of trial. And, and obviously uh, that's not possible at the arraignment since you know we're just, we're just having to process the, the complaint. I see. Uh, what percentage of cell phones vouchered by the NYPD do you move for? Uh, do you move search warrants for? Um, I, I can tell you that uh, in calendar year 2020, um, the office uh, obtained search warrants on, on somewhere between 100 and 150 uh, phones. And I think um, if you give us a few days, I think we can give you a concrete number on that. Uh, but between 100 and 150 uh, warrants were obtained for uh, cell phones that were recovered. Do you have any idea uh, how many phones are actually kept if cases are dismissed? If, I guess I'm not clear, you're asking if where a demand has been made any case where there's been disposition, the phones will get released upon demand. Okay, so you're saying that in every case where so a case that is dismissed, those phones are immediately given given back to the individual. I'm saying if they've made a demand for the property to be released, we immediately process them and release the property. Uh, if they had previously made a demand and that demand had been deferred based upon one of the reasons I stated earlier then once the case is resolved, whether it's through plea or disposition or dismissal where the, the item is no longer needed, the release will be issued immediately. Do you know how many um, DA uh, requ uh, requests, uh, relief requests uh, are received within a year? Uh, hold on, I can give you the number for 2020. Um, and how long it actually takes you to comply with them? Uh, within 15 days. Uh, we have never not met the uh, deadline that's imposed by the New York City rules and regulation. In calendar year 2020, we received a total of 3,089 demands. Eighty-nine, twenty-twenty. 2020. That's 2020, yes. Okay. For the case where you don't consent to release, how many are actually oh, appealed? I'm sorry, let me revise that. That was actually 2019. 1,679 in 2020. I apologize for that. <laughs> 1,679? Uh, yes, ma'am. All right. And then my follow-up question was how, and then for those that are not consented to release on, how many are actually appealed? The total number of appeals filed in 2020 were seven. Seven. Okay. 
Apart from a release form, do you ask for a I didn't hear your question. Okay. I'm sorry, Chair. Maybe I apologize. My internet is unstable. Chair, maybe try stopping your video. Can you hear me? Let's try that way. Is that better? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, great. So um, apart from a release form, do you also ask for a copy of the NYPD voucher? Uh, in other words, do you ever accept something in lieu of the voucher? No, we, we, require, like we require the voucher. If the defendant or claimant does not have the voucher, um, we then look for it in our system. And if we don't have it, we then have to go to the NYPD uh, to obtain a copy of it. Oh, interesting. Okay. How many of the um, how many of the releases are for cell phones? I don't have immediate access to that. Um, I, I can provide that for you at a at a later date. Um, we'd have to run a, a a report to to obtain that, and we have not been able to uh, to get that as of today. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to um, stop here council and go to uh, my colleagues' questions. Um, we have a few council members here to ask if anyone wants to ask questions, you use the Zoom raise hand function. If not, we will turn to the public. Seeing no hands, thank you very much, Mr. DeLuca Ferugia. Thank you. Um, we will now hear from members of the public. Um, we have six uh, witnesses, so I'll just let everybody know the order right up front so you all know uh, when you're coming up. First up will be Marianne Kashian from Brooklyn Defender Services, followed by Yamina Chekroon from New York County Defender Services, followed by Raisa Carpenter uh, from the Legal Aid Society, David O'Brien from New York County Defender Services, Marianne Rosa from the Bronx Defenders, and Tawaki Kamatsu. So first up, Marianne Kaishian from Brooklyn Defender Services. Thanks, Josh. No. Good morning, and thank you to the City Council, particularly Chair Adams, for holding this important hearing. It's impossible to overstate the frequency with which New Yorkers are having their property seized by the NYPD. And the testimony making it seem like these items are seized primarily in serious cases is frankly fiction that seems ripped from a police procedural show. Um, furthermore, the testimony that, you know, these items are left on the shelf until the NYPD can legally take ownership amounts to really, you know, we stole it uh, until it became ours. Um, and also suggesting that the police don't have a vested interest in holding property is simply untrue, um, especially when, you know, non-vehicular items such as wedding rings were sold at auction and netted over $425,000 last year alone for police pension funds. We know that these seizures occur whether or not the owner of the property is ultimately prosecuted for or even accused of criminal conduct. Property is taken when it has no connection to alleged criminal conduct, and it's sometimes sold by the police after they've stonewalled the rightful owner from, re from retrieving it. And as defense attorneys, we can attest that we, you know, even as trained advocates and lawyers, find the property return process extremely taxing, time-consuming, frustrating, and ad hoc. Um, and, you know, people have to navigate this without legal representation often, especially if they are retrieving property in cases that were never brought for prosecution. The right to counsel doesn't attach. And we have countless harms about the illegitimate, illegitimate and unreasonable property seizures uh, through the course of our representation of people here in Brooklyn. We represented a young person who was the victim of a, a shooting. And while he was in surgery, the NYPD came, seized his phone and his clothing, and labeled it as investigatory. He was not suspected of a crime, but his phone and his only means of communicating with his loved ones and updating them on his progress and his health uh, was taken for over two months and he was left without recourse. We represented a young person who witnessed a police assault. Um, when he attempted to recall, call, record this assault, it was taken um, as evidence. I represented young people whose arrests were baseless and not pursued by prosecutors, but whose phones were taken during those encounters 
for investigatory purposes in other matters, in other matters, which really amounts to a warrant workaround. The police are using baselets arrests that will not hold up in court to gain evidence that they later use in other unrelated prosecutions. Um, the NYPD will also create unrealistic and impossible requirements to return, such as requiring docket numbers or prosecutor approval on cases that were never brought to for prosecution and thus never assigned any sort of prosecutor in a district attorney's office. Um, and the, the impacts of this are real, and I'm sure that other speakers will speak to this, but we're living in a time when virtual school is happening, virtual work is happening, we have only limited ways of connecting with our friends and loved ones. And so taking people's technology, especially for young people, is incredibly isolating and damaging. We also represented a mom whose car was seized as a result of her son's arrest. And even though we were in touch with her from our with the NYPD I'm from inquired. our office, I'm sorry if I, if I may just finish, for well over a year. Um, we were unaware that the NYPD had taken the items inside the car, including a baby's car seat, and destroyed it. Um, and the current rules allow this. Furthermore, we have every reason to believe, given the NYPD's data capabilities and testimony from cell phone and laptop owners that we've represented about the state of their items after they're returned, that the NYPD is using its unchecked power to seize property as a warrantless and illegal intelligence gathering tool. We know that since 2018, the NYPD has had the technological capability to break into and make copies of electronic devices and information stored, not on the physical device, but in iCloud, in app, social media app, and in other information and make copies of these items in a clandestine way. Um, and we have no reason to believe that that's not happening while these cell phones and other technology are being held in their, in their possession. Um, we ask the city council to pursue responses to this harm that don't simply create new rules for the NYPD to decline to follow because the truth is that there are already rules in place, such as a requirement for a warrant that simply aren't being respected. Um, as in so many areas of police practice, rules and legal constraints do exist. They're simply disregarded. And so this is an issue of unchecked police power and accountability, and it's a persistent disregard for the rules intended to safeguard the civil rights of the people of New York. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, sorry, one moment. Next up will be Yamina Chekrun from New York County Defender Services. Hi. Hi, my name is Yamina Sarah Chekrun, and I am an attorney at NYCDS. The property issues presented in today's hearing are frequent in my practice. Unlike housing or licensing issues, they are among the most frustrating because of lack of clarity, lack of due process, and lack of oversight. Our public defense clients, of whom people of color are disproportionately represented, are forced to navigate through a number of obstacles to retrieve their property. More often than not, the property is never even used as evidence in the prosecution's case. It is my experience that these obstacles are, by design, implemented in such a way that make it nearly impossible for a person to retrieve their personal property in a reasonable manner. For example, when a cell phone is taken from a client and vouchered by the NYPD as arrest evidence, they are subjected to the following. After being arraigned, a person may have no idea that their phone has been taken for any other reason than safekeeping. This is because no instructions are given and arresting officers do not always provide vouchers. A person may go back to the precinct and ask for their property back. They may be told, no, the property is being kept as evidence. If the precinct does not give them a voucher, they must then borrow someone's phone to call their lawyer. They ask them how to get their phone back. The lawyer asks for the voucher because this is the only way they can identify and confirm the specific property category and the appropriate steps to take. They are then instructed to go to one police plaza to finally obtain the voucher. They must send their lawyer a copy of the voucher. Normally a text photo would suffice, but without a phone, this adds an additional layer of complication. An in-person meeting with the attorney to present the voucher. If the law office has the capacity, which many do not, they will request a district attorney's release on their behalf and they will have to wait 15 days for an answer. If their lawyer does not have the capacity, well, the client just has to return to 100 Center Street and go up to the seventh floor with their ID and their voucher. The person at the window makes a request to, D to DA to release the phone. It's now a full two weeks without a phone. The request was denied. No substantial reason was given. Often the reiteration of arrest evidence will present itself with no su other supporting facts. 
There's nothing our clients can do other than wait for the case to be disposed of. With the endless backlog caused by court closures, this could be months or years. By creating a protocol system that ensures that the property being kept by the NYPD is legitimately needed as evidence in a case, we ensure that in individuals are not unfairly losing the right to personal property at the tremendous cost of losing the connection to their lifelines. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next up will be right, Raisa Carpenter from the Legal Aid Society. Time starts now. Good morning. My name is Raisa Carpenter. I'm a staff attorney with the Legal Aid Society's criminal defense practice where I represent people who are arrested and prosecuted in Brooklyn. Whenever a person is arrested by the NYPD, regardless of how minor the offense, the person is searched. And during the course of that search, property is seized. Our clients have their cell phones seized as well as identification, money, cars, and countless other items that they need to navigate life in New York City. Property seizure should be short-term and primarily for safekeeping. After a person is released from custody, all of their property should be returned. Unfortunately, that is not happening. Instead, NYPD officers seize any property they can and broadly categorize it in a way that allows for long-term retention, often for months and in some cases years. By saying that it may be contraband or evidence of a crime, classifications that there is often no justification for. NYPD's operating assumption seems to be that any potentially valuable property, any phone, any money, even petty cash, recovered from someone who's been arrested must have been obtained through illicit means. We urge you to reject that assumption. You have heard many stories about the devastating impact that property seizure has on people's lives and how this practice perpetuates the trauma and terror that people experience at the hands of the NYPD every single day. Our clients are seized on the street arrested, searched, have their property confiscated, and then they're placed in holding cells, shackled in central booking, processed through the court system, and they're finally released, only to discover that their phone, identification, and money, all tools of survival, may be held by police and prosecutors indefinitely. The result is that our clients struggle to communicate with friends and family, further struggle to pay rent, buy groceries, complete their jobs or education programs, schedule and attend medical appointments, and even to attend future remote court appearances. In 2013, then Justice Neil Gorsuch asked the following question. What after all is reasonable about police seizing an individual's property on the ground that it potentially contains relevant evidence and then simply neglecting for months or years to search that property to determine whether it really does hold relevant evidence needed for trial or is totally irrelevant to the investigation and should be returned to its rightful owner? On behalf of thousands of our clients, our answer to Justice Gorsuch's question is nothing. Nothing is reasonable about the practice of arbitrary and indefinite retention of property essential to modern life. And right now, our clients have no legal recourse to get their property back. We urge the council to partner with us and develop a legislative fix to this chronic problem, a legislative fix that creates a clear time frame for release, a presumption in favor of returning property to those it was taken from, and an opportunity to seek the intervention of a judge whenever NYPD claims an interest in retaining our client's property. Thank you for shedding light on this unacceptable practice. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. Next up will be David O'Brien from New York County Defender Services. Time starts now. Good morning. Thank you for having me here today. My name is David O'Brien and I'm a trial attorney with the Juvenile Defense Unit at New York County Defender Services. My unit represents raised the age children in felony cases in both Supreme and Family Court. I'm here to testify on an issue that's of utmost importance, the confiscation of our clients' cell phones by the NYPD, which occur as a matter of course when they are arrested. The vast majority of court appearances in New York City are occurring virtually. If a child does not appear in court, a warrant can be issued. Our clients are also often required to participate in programming as part of their cases, which are occurring virtually as well. Participation often determines whether a child will earn youthful offender treatment and avoid a lifelong felony record, or whether a child is permitted to remain in the community at all. In some cases, of course, a phone is legitimate arrest evidence. And in those cases, it makes sense that the NYPD and prosecutors would need it for a limited period of time. These scenarios represent a fraction of the cases we see where our clients lose their phone to the police, often permanently. Despite previous representations made in this hearing, phones are routinely held indefinitely as arrest evidence when there is no discernible connection to the case. In these cases, 
The seriousness of the allegations are irrelevant to this injustice. Just because charges are serious does not magically turn the phone into evidence. It's a fishing expedition at best. Other testimony you've heard today backs this up. ADA DeLuca Ferrugia testified that his office, the Queens District Attorney, requested search warrants for 150 phones in 2019, while the NYPD's own data says that in that borough alone, over 16,500 phones were vouchered. And citywide that, that year, the number was over 92,000. We spent hours on the phone trying to figure out where our clients' phones are and how we can get them back. It's a wild goose chase that almost always comes up empty-handed. Without a phone, young people cannot log into their court appearances. They also cannot call their attorneys, their probation officers, the programs they're mandated to attend, remote therapy sessions they're required to complete, or conduct court-ordered curfew checks. If parents stay home to work so that their child can use their phone, they lose money to support their family and sometimes even put their jobs at risk. Moreover, the vast majority of young people in the system come from low-income families. Often the phone that was confiscated was the only phone the family had, and therefore the entire family is less disconnected. Just recently, a 16-year-old client of ours was arrested in his home and every electronic device in the house was confiscated. And now multiple siblings have no way of logging into remote school. This family has now been floundering for months. For, for another client, 14 years old, whose case has been pending for almost a year with literally no action from the prosecution and where there's no apparent connection between the phone and the case, this confiscation is a maddening financial hardship. His mother is in a binding service contract and she continues to pay the phone bill despite not having the phone. She has had to do this through a house fire that destroyed everything she owned and a, through a hospitalization for COVID and with no end in sight or any answers about when they will get the phone back. In a time when the phone represents a young person- hard. Thank you, I'm, I'm almost finished. At, at a time when the phone represents a young person's entire ability to engage with their family, school, work, and most relevant here, court appearances and obligations. And when cases are dragging on for many months longer than usual, that confiscation is completely unjust and unacceptable. This problem must be tackled immediately. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next up will be uh, Marianne Rosa from uh, Bronx Defenders. Time starts now. Good morning. My name is Marianne Rosa, and I am a legal advocate with the Bronx Defenders Civil Action Practice. Because of a 2017 law requiring the NYPD to disclose information on seized property, the public now has greater awareness of what we as civil public defenders in the Bronx have known for years that merely for having contact with the criminal justice system can mean lengthy seizure of essential personal property or it even disappearing permanently into a black hole. Every day we see the harm of the city's archaic property retrieval procedures on our clients and their families. NYPD seizure of property such as cash, house keys and cell phones and vehicles leads to temporary homelessness, loss of employment and inability to meet familial obligations. In the last 12 months, we've assisted clients in almost 500 property cases. Even with the assistance of an advocate, our clients experience months long delays in retrieving property because of the overly complicated nature of the process. For example, contrary to the NYPD's assertions this morning, we have seen countless cases where an NYPD officer seizes property during an arrest and unlawfully categorizes it as investigatory. There is no specific procedure for how a claimant would request a release from the investigating officer or what happens if the investigating officer fails to respond to that request at all or declines to provide a release, even if the criminal case is dismissed. And even the process for property marked as arrest evidence where the district attorney unilaterally decides whether to re retain property is inadequate. It is unnecessarily complicated and confusing. And other than for vehicles, there is no judicial review. In our written testimony, we also touch on the NYPD's archaic forfeiture program. In sum, the NYPD's practices seem designed to thwart our clients rather than to serve the public. The time for half measures is over. The council should act to end these abusive practices and bring New York City in line with other jurisdictions around the country. This would include repealing and replacing admin code 14140 with streamlined accessible procedures in plain language, requiring a judicial hearing to review the NYPD's designation of property and money as evidence, a process which currently only exists for vehicles, but no other forms of property, abolishing the NYPD's ability to permanently seize property and money as revenue through civil forfeiture under 14140. We urge the council to act now to end the harm that lengthy unnecessary seizure of personal property can cause, exacerbating the already distressing toll of the COVID-19 pandemic. Are you finished? 
Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm going to turn it back to the chair who has a few questions for all of the defenders. Um, so we're going to actually invite you all to unmute yourselves um, and, and just be mindful if you're not speaking at the time that you are going to be unmuted, but just so that we can you can answer when you when you would like to. Um, so while you're unmuting yourselves, I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you, Council, and I apologize for my video off and on, but uh, as I mentioned, I am having internet problems today, so I think the only way that I can uh, be heard is to turn the camera off and that you all won't freeze on me. I've got to keep the camera off. So thank you so much for your testimony this morning. It is so appreciated. This, um, this issue is something that uh, is so relevant, um, especially now during COVID. It is relevant to the, the people, uh, Ms. Rosa, as you just said, that have been vic victimized by this, um, particularly to our youth and communities of color, low income, um, to families that depend on this. You know, it, we, we've got to do something about it. Um, so this question is for all of you. And again, thank you so much for your testimony. How long does it normally take for your clients to get their property back? Well, I can speak um, if no one else is, uh, wants to go first. I'll put on my video. So in our cases, generally, they're held until the case is over. And in the raise the age cases, uh, they start in the youth part of Supreme Court. If they are removed to family court, then the paperwork is transferred to the prosecutors there. But that doesn't mean that any case is filed at that point. And therefore, there's not even a prosecutor available to talk to about consenting to a release of the phone. And because of the pandemic, the deadlines of when they have to file a case uh, have been expanded or suspended for over a year now. And so I don't have an average amount of time, but I can say that in our cases, it's many months to over a year if they get the phone back at all. Wow. Just to echo um, so what, what actually happened. Oh, go. Go Sorry, ahead, so, thank you. Just to echo what, what uh, David is saying, in cases that are not involving juveniles, so they're not removed, we're also facing similar delays. So there's no set time uh, in which a person will retrieve their property. But certainly where there have been delays in speedy trial time. So even while we're waiting for certain cases to be dismissed, they're even going on longer than usual. Um, there's delays between somebody's arrest often. And if they're issued a desk appearance ticket, they go a significant amount of time between the issuance of the ticket and their actual appearance, at which point counsel attaches. Um, so that could be months of them attempting to navigate the return of their property without any sort of assistance. Um, and then there are additional delays with, with, with the courts not being open um, and with, again, this is delays between counsel uh, visits. So often it takes over a year for someone to get their property back. And I'd say also often people abandon their property because they try, they make multiple visits to precincts, they're sent to various property clerks, they're given conflicting information depending on who mm -hmm. they speak to at any given time at the precinct. Um, and so a lot of times people will never get their property back. And I think that that's mm -hmm. something that everybody who's testified today has touched on. Um, I'd like to second what Marianne said about clients giving up on getting their property. Um, you know, oftentimes if they aren't able to speak to an attorney that is knowledgeable about property issues, because not all criminal defenders have the capacity or the time to become well-versed in all the different procedural um, steps, um, you know, they will go to the precinct and be told that they need something else or need to go somewhere else. And it just becomes very confusing putting all the pieces together. And so they'll just think that they can't get their property back. Um, and they will just fully give up. And that's in particular, if they don't end up with a voucher after arraignments, um, in my experience, the likelihood of seeing someone who's just given up on getting the property is very, is very high. Yeah, you know, that, that's actually where I was going with this. I, I thought it was particularly disturbing to hear that if someone did not have a voucher and couldn't produce ID, I think that's very unreasonable. So I would imagine that we would lose a lot of, prop, quote unquote, lose, uh, a lot of property that way. And, and you know, for, for me, that's an issue. That That's a stinging issue with me. Um, something else that I want to touch on. Uh, you, did you want to say something else? You mean, go ahead. Um, you know, oftentimes the precinct will actually give um, 
the person, uh, the invoice number, they will write it down on a piece of paper. But unfortunately, it is not sufficient, in my mm -hmm. experience, to provide the district attorney's office with only the invoice number in order to request a release. They require the full copy of the voucher. Um, and so having a client then, you know, go to one police plaza, especially when they live all the way uptown, um, particularly during the pandemic, just seemed like such an unreasonable ask, but it was an ask that I, I had to make, you know, quite frequently. Yeah, if, uh, I would admit also if they would live, also if they live in South Jamaica, Queens, where I live. Yes, exactly. If I could jump in as well. Uh, I think another issue that we see with clients is not necessarily actively giving up, but feeling as though they have no other option. You know, they first go to the precinct themselves and try to retrieve the property. And then when that's not successful, sometimes they're just told, no, you can't have it back right now. You need to wait for DA release. And then that's when they contact the attorney and the attorney tries to seek the release. But unless the attorney is notified to then notify their client, the client's never given notice of when the property status changes within the NYPD. So you'll have the attorney seeking the release from the DA's office. And in some case, the release is granted, but we're never notified. So the only way that you find out is by continually calling the DA's office back and getting someone to respond to you and let you know that, yes, that release has been granted. But then we've even had situations where clients go to pick up the phone, being told that a DA release was needed and the DA release is granted. And then it's at that point that the NYPD decides to reclassify the property for seizure so that then a whole new process starts over. So if you see people giving up, not because they, they want to give up or because they don't care about the property anymore, but because so many obstacles are put in their way that they feel that there's no way for them to succeed. I also can, yeah. I just want to add one thing, yeah. uh, this particular to our clients in the youth part. Um, is that you know in the rare cases where the district attorney or corporation counsel does consent to the release of the phone and when it is properly reclassified by NYPD in the PET system, that's often after a, a long runaround process and it's very rare when this happens at all. But there is this uh, catch 22 where our clients uh, are too young to have driver's licenses and really the only ID they have is a school mm. ID and school has been virtual. Mm. And so they have the NYPD does not accept last year's ID, which are the only IDs that they have. Mm. And so their, their parents are not allowed to pick up the phone for uh, their phones for them unless they have a notarized letter from our child client giving their parent permission to pick up the phone, their, their property for them. And oftentimes a notary would require that child to have an ID as well. Mm -hmm. And so there's this circumstance where even in the rare instances when they can possibly get their phone back before the case concludes, it's really impossible to do so. Wow. Uh, uh, just one more thing around that, David, and, and you can probably answer this just to piggyback and, and, and then I'm, that, that's gonna be it for me. Um, you know, something that's near and dear to my heart is education of our children. And we see, you know, our kids going through this process and going, through the system and a lot of times it's just, um, you know, just so unnecessary to put them through this. Um, what's disturbing um, to me is the, the virtual learning, the remote learning, phones are taken away. Um, so if your client is a juvenile and they use their vouchered phone for e-learning, how does your client do remote learning? Is it just impossible? Oftentimes it is impossible. Yeah. Oftentimes uh, they use their parents' phones and then cannot, e either their parents stay home, miss work, lose their jobs, or their parents are not in communication while they're out of the house. And, or they just scramble and try to make it to some camera that they can. And you know this is a problem with um, services in the youth part as well, coming and dialing into court, checking in with probation like you're supposed to. And these are often preconditions that are dangled in front of our clients for either a favorable disposition in the case or, or a removal to family court. And they really, it's, it's really often takes Herculean efforts to comply if the family is financially able to do so. Wow, so disturbing. Um, I, I do have one more question. Marianne, I, I don't wanna let this go. Um, you suggested amending um, uh, 14140 uh, with better procedures. Can you just give me an idea of what you think it would look like or the system would look like or what you suggest 
the system would look like that would allow um, DAs to still access relevant evidence? Yep, so I mean, I think for our office, our hope would be a full repeal and replacing of 14140. Um, right now, vehicles are the that are marked for civil forfeiture um, or arrest evidence are the only property where there is um, an attempt at judicial review. Um, so we would like to see all property you know, to be considered where there's an ability for someone outside of just the NYPD or the district, district attorney's office to unilaterally decide whether or not they should be able to retain property. And our office, um, you know, would look forward to continue this discussion um, and look mm -hmm. into this. We can definitely get back to you. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, thank you all so much for this testimony. It's been extremely valuable um, for me. And I really appreciate your work. I appreciate all that you do, uh, particularly for our youth out there, our, our youth that are struggling, our youth in trouble. Um, you all are the ones that have really, really, really um, uh, been there when beneath their wings. So I commend you for your great work. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council, to the I turn it back to you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to the defenders. Um, before we turn to our next witness, I would just invite any other member of the public who has not signed up to testify, who is present and who wishes to testify, to please use the Zoom raise hand function. Um, I will now turn to Tawaki Kamatsu, and if any other hands are raised, we'll turn to them uh, after. Uh, Mr. Kamatsu. Thanks, Austin. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, so yeah, uh, so Oleg Chernowski, um, I've talked to him before in the city council, well, I should say in city hall. Um, with regards to the property, I guess, uh, seizure, collection, and return issue of, that was discussed today, um, he basically lied through his teeth. Um, he was sworn under oath when he made his remarks today. Um, I previously beat the NYPD in court. I have a federal lawsuit against the NYPD now as a countersuit, it's assigned to Federal Judge Valerie Caproni. Um, case number is 20 CV 10942. Um, after I was arrested, the NYPD illegally did not uh, collect all of my property. Um, it, it also uh, lost possession of my wallet while I was in the NYPD's custody. Um, the officers involved were NYPD officer Sequoia Harris of the 48th Precinct, uh, Stephen Perez. Uh, Mr. Harris accompanied me to, accompanied me to um, the hospital after he criminally assaulted me. Um, and while I was in the custody in the hospital, he was uh, what, jiggling the handcuffs behind my back that likely caused the wallet to fall on my uh, pocket. And no search was thereafter conducted by the NYPD to try to find that wallet, the uh, business cards, the um, like a social security card, all that kind of stuff um, that can be used to commit identity theft. So uh, once I realized that I apprised the NYPD about that fact, they never conducted a search. I talked to the uh, commanding officer of the precinct. Um, they basically said, you know what? We gave you your wallet back while you were in, in our custody. It was your responsibility to maintain control over that property while you were in handcuffs. So the question is if Mr. Chernowski is lying through his teeth uh, during today's hearing while he's sworn under oath, at what point uh, will the NYC New York City Council step up to the plate and essentially impose sanctions against him for lying through his teeth by claiming that there's you know, proper oversight of uh, protocols and procedures when in fact there isn't. Um, also, um, after I met up with Mr. Harris, this all happened on December 26th of 2017. Um, he didn't have his body camera turned on when he and I first met. He criminally assaulted me in a public corridor. Um, I've testified about that repeatedly to the city council to no avail. Um, and to try to close out my testimony, Heim Deutsch, he's no longer a member of the city council, the reason why, he violated applicable law and uh, his colleagues in the city council who still are members of the council did so as well. So yesterday I filed paper uh, with, with a federal lawsuit that I have asking a federal judge to um, allow Mr. Deutsch to have some company by essentially terminating the employment of members of the city council with the city of New York effective immediately um, pursuant to the same law that Mr. Deutsch was fired under. Um, anyway, have a good day. Bye. Thank you for your testimony. At this time, I do not see any raised hands, so I will turn it back over to the chair to close out the hearing. Thank you so much, Council. 
I'd like to thank uh, members of the NYPD, DAs, office members, my colleagues, public defenders, my legal staff for working on today's hearing, Daniel Addis, Maxwell Campton Williams, Aliyah Reynolds, and Matthew Thompson. Thank you also to our uh, moderator behind the scenes, Malcolm Butehorn, for your guest appearance today during this hearing. Uh, that said,